Um, so uh, welcome to the workshop on uh, the Mason Mile uh, and the opportunities um, for Greater Manchester. Could I introduce um, Anna and then Rosie from the Mason Mile and then hand the floor over and you can share all about it. So Anna. Fantastic. Thank you, Louise. And thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to present to you today. So my name is Anna Skeets and I'm the CEO of the Mason Foundation. Hi, Thank I'm Rosie, Rosie and I'm the Head of Operations and Engagement at the, the Mason Foundation. So, Fantastic. Shall I take back the, uh, the, the reins and explain a little bit more about the Mason Foundation? Yeah. yeah. Um, Rosie, are you OK to share our presentation? Yep, I'm just doing that now. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Everyone see? Let me know when you can see your screen, everybody. Yep, can see it now, yep. Fantastic, yep. brilliant. And if you can hop onto the next slide for me, please, Rosie. Hopefully Which screen am I sharing there. here? Ah, fantastic, perfect. So if I give, um, firstly, a little bit of an introduction to the Mason Foundation. So we were a um, relatively young charity. So we were formed in 2017 and we were set up by our founder, Stephen Mason. And Stephen, um, he has a disability himself and has always been very passionate about supporting access and inclusivity into activity. So that was his starting, starting point really for coming up with um, the Mason Foundation charity. Um, Stephen, being a keen um, sportsman himself, wanted to provide an opportunity for people to participate um, that wouldn't perhaps otherwise find it easy to access mainstream activity. So that's where the concept of the Mason Mile and the Family Mile came from. So ultimately, it was a, a, an opportunity to bring communities together to basically do their mile in a way that worked for them. So really um, taking all of the real strengths of organisations like Park Run, where it's community and volunteer led, but with a subtle difference that we're really reaching out to those communities that perhaps need the support the most in terms of helping to access these sorts of activities. So that was Stephen's starting point. And back in 2017, that was simply Stephen going out in the local parks, rallying the supports of the local communities, talking, learning, listening to the people to understand what were the barriers to physical activity? Why were people not um, necessarily taking part? And what could we do to, to try and overcome that? And during this time, Steam captured the hearts of, of lots of people from the community and various organisations. And one of those organisations was Sport England. And Sport England um, allowed us to have that initial um, seed funding back in 2017 to take Stephen's vision and concept and turn it into a, a tangible blueprint. So that was really the birth of the Mason Foundation and the Mason Mile. And that's where Rosie and I came on board and the charity we really started to form. And um, initially that was um, delivery across Kent. And that was a, a case of um, really setting up the family mile in the community. So where would it be delivered? How would it be delivered? Who would deliver it? Um, how would we engage people? So what do people want to do when they come and walk together in parks? And we learned a lot during this an initial pilot year. We learned that families particularly wanted fun. They wanted innovative, they wanted engaging. So we started to develop miles such as the nature mile, adventure miles, mystery miles, as real hooks to it to engage and insight, particularly young families. And that went from strength to strength. Um, obviously during that those initial um, years we, we we had the challenges of, of COVID as we're still working our way through. And um, we had that the decision point um, during the uh, initial lockdown as to do we, we down tools and wait, or do we actually really stand up and be counted at a time when communities really need that support the most? Uh, and clearly we decided the latter. Um, and we really started to develop an online presence. So talking to our communities through social media, we, we built up that following. And we started to create lots of online content that was focused around families being active together. Um, and we developed um, a campaign, Your Mile, Your Way, um, and very much the mantra of 15 minutes of activity equates to a mile. So if families couldn't necessarily get out and do a physical mile, 
what could they do to, to move more and remain active or to start to be active as a family? So we gave them lots of fun, exciting ways to do that using various um, household crops such as milk bottles, bean bags, balls, to, to, to really just infuse um, our families. That again went from strength to strength and allowed us to really accelerate the development of our community app. So our community app became um, an opportunity for us to connect our communities in these really difficult times where physical connections were obviously very challenging. So that has developed through 2020. Um, and we were, as I said, we have grown from strength to strength and we've been fortunate to secure our second round of um, funding through Sport England to take the Maidstone learning, the Kent learning within that pilot area and really um, scale it. And that was through the development of our ambassador model. So across Kent and London, we um, rolled out our ambassador model across six localities, of which five we've already completed. And that is um, Thanet, Medway, Maidstone, Southwark and Thamesmead. So areas where we have real um, deprivation and an inequality. And for the Mason Foundation, our mission is really to address those inequalities. So there is a dis discreet emphasis on supporting communities with families that have got um, physical or emotional difficulties. They've got low, in low income families and BAMI communities. Um, and that ambassador model has gone um, again from strength to strength. So again, it's that learning from Park Run and other um, really successful programs where we are building that capacity within the community. And I'd say our real USP is the fact that we remain local. We really do our teams roll up our sleeves and, and understand what the community wants. We listen and we adapt. So what worked in our initial pilot area in Kent hasn't been the same as what we've delivered across areas of London. And again, won't be the same when we start to deliver across Birmingham and Manchester. So I think the re really important point to remember with the Mason Foundation is that flexibility and that community led approach. And, and I think at this point, it would be um, a good point to hand over to Rosie to talk in a bit more detail about the actual delivery to date. And then Rosie will pass back to me to talk specifically about our hopes and plans for, for Manchester, for the Greater Manchester area. Rosie, over to you. Thank you. So as we enter into a locality, the, the first thing that we do is undertake a, some quite um, extensive desk-based research into um, the, the movers and shakers in the area, really. And then from that research and those conversations that we start to have, we form a local partnership or steering group. Now this is headed up by us at the foundation and our um, sort of key partners and, and supporters in, in the area. So uh, in areas of Kent and, and London, that can either be housing associations, corporates, um, we've got a local authority who heads up one of them. And really that steering group is really to asset map the area. So we get a real understanding of, of what services are available and how the Mason Mile or the Family Mile concept can work with those services and within the community at a really grassroots level and add value. Um, what we don't ever want to do is come in, helicopter in and, and provide something that's either not needed or doesn't add value to other services. So we see ourselves very much as that starting point of activity. We know that lots of areas have things like health walks and park runs, um, although quite often they're, they're targeted either at older communities, older individuals, or people that are, have that, that level of fitness that are able to, to take on a 5K. And we position ourselves very much as a fun, engaging, um, and accessible way to, to start your journey into physical activity. So with our, our local sort of supporting partners and funders, we work with them to identify a local delivery partner. Now our delivery partner really is intrinsic in keeping us local. The majority of us in the, in the foundation are, are based in the southeast, and that has been crucial and core to, to our success of delivery within, within areas of Kent and London, because we know those areas. When we're planning on moving to, to Greater Manchester and, and the Northwest, obviously we're, we're not as au fait with, with those local communities. So working hand in hand with a local grassroots partner, one gives us that credibility with the local community, like yes, they're working with somebody that we know and trust, 
but it also gives us access to that community in the front door by, by working with that partner who knows the local area like, like the back of the hand, like we do with, with the South East. It also provides an injection of funding to that grassroots VCSE sort of infrastructure as this, the local delivery partner role is, is a funded um, post. So, so we sort of support the infrastructure of the area that way. Um, each of our, our miles, each of our localities, we have an ambition to recruit and train 10 ambassadors per area. Now, our ambassadors come from all walks of life and from um, lots of different backgrounds. And it really is working again with the local community to see where those ambassadors would be best placed and, and best come from. So with one of our local authorities, we've actually trained some of their lead workers that work within the primary care networks uh, to deliver miles from the DPs practices they work in. And this is to really capture an audience of people who, who don't weren't necessarily want to take that step into the GP practice to talk about social issues. They would feel more comfortable doing that in a less clinical um, setting. And that's proved to be very popular. We have ambassadors who are retired. We have ambassadors that have um, physical disabilities themselves and are supported to engage with the ambassador role in for their community. So we really don't say no to, to anyone. We, we always say that there is a role for you with us, whether that's physically delivering miles, whether it's supporting us by social media, engagement, um, wh whatever it is, we, we will gladly support communities to support the, the mile model within, within their local area. We aim to deliver a minimum of five miles per week by the end of the fund of the first year of funding. So these are regular miles that are delivered by our ambassadors um, so, uh, each week at a time and a place that works for them. So unlike um, Park Run, which is a great model, it works very well for them and it's 9.30 on a Saturday morning. Um, we're saying that what time and place works for you. So um, in our Maidstone, for example, we have a lot of mother and, and toddler groups or child, parent, adult and toddler groups. Um, and they tend to be at about 10 o'clock and during a week so because that's really what works for them. And we've also got an evening stroll that captures people on their way home from work. And again, that has proved quite popular. And it's through trial and error and talking to the ambassadors, talking about what works for them, what they've noticed in their community, we can then secure those, those times and places that, that will work for, for the, wider, the wider community. Our miles are fun, engaging, interactive. We worked um, during our, our sort of phase one, as Anna was discussing earlier, we found out from our community and, and the people that we were working with that they wanted exercise that didn't necessarily feel like they were taking part in physical activity. So we do nature miles, we have journey sticks, we have adventure miles and mystery miles. And these are all sort of off the shelf packages and toolkits that our ambassadors can just take from their hub and which they have access to and they can embed that into, into their delivery. We also work with ambassadors to deliver their, on their own interests. So um, one of our ambassadors in London, for example, she has a history degree. She is really keen to um, do a historical mile through, through the historical quarter of, of Southwark. Um, and she's really excited by that. And because she's passionate by it, people are flocking to that mile and getting excited by it, by it too, for her passion. We're also talking to some local ambassadors in Medway, where I'm based, um, around delivering a photography mile, just using a, a smartphone, because lots of people have smartphones and it's just a way of making that that 15 minute walk a bit more interesting a bit more engaging for the whole family we aim to engage 200 families across the tw first 12 months of delivery and by engagement we mean signing up for the family mile not just attending a mile but physically signing up through our, our type form or, or by registering with an ambassador um, and they will then from from that sign up get quarterly emails and access to our rewards network which includes um, like local rewards such as free family swims, free soft play sessions. <clears throat> we have some links with Medway, uh, with adult education services where we provide um, sort of sessions, mindfulness sessions for families. Anything that really brings families together, spending social time together, but also time where they can be exploring something that they perhaps haven't had the opportunity to do before. Um, they also get caps, t-shirts, water bottles that are all branded the family mile, just to show that they are part of this national movement. And it was great actually, we've, we've got some events going on at the moment and throughout lockdown, we've been giving away these t-shirts as, as part of our um, online online engagement that we've been doing. 
and we were seeing people come in with the t-shirts that they'd earned over lockdown that they'd done 100 miles and that was wonderful to, to see that and it just brings the, the whole sort of um, Myla community together. And 50% of these families, we're aiming to engage about 600 people in the first year and then it grows year on year as, as our ambassador model strengthens and it sort of embeds in the community. 50% of those families are from our, our targeted communities. So as Anna was saying, low income and the AME and also those with long-term health conditions or, or disability. And we also deliver a large scale community event. We're doing these at the moment, which is why we might be a little frazzled with we're sort of running from one locality to another. But this is really a celebration to launch the mile and celebrate that, that sense of community. It brings community services together. We have social prescribing services. We have um, caring in the community services. We, have, uh, we had a bike repair service that was community based at our last event. And it really is just to signpost people to those organisations. And we also have um, a bespoke Mason Mile app, where again, our milers can come together. It's a supportive environment that um, it allows people to take their first step into activity with a, a like-minded community around them. Um, we have specific pages for our, our local areas. So we've got one for Medway, one for Maidstone, one for Thamesmead, one for Thameside, whoever it is we're working with. So people can engage with their local community. We also recognise that they are part of a national movement and get that, um, that support, motivation and encouragement without the noise of a, a bigger social media platform. So it's not for tracking miles, it's just for sort of that support, encouragement and motivation. Um, and there's lots of fun tools on there as well about how you can make your miles fun as a family without actually necessarily even attending one of our, our in-person family miles. So the ambassador journey, it's, it's a 12-month journey. Um, after 12 months, we consider ambassadors sort of fully, fully trained. Um, months one to three, very intensive training periods. This um, requires some screen time, some screen training. There's Zoom sessions. We have three in total. They take about six hours, um, of course there's two hours per Zoom session, and, and that usually takes about a month, month and a half to, to undergo, because we know that people don't necessarily have time to sit down on the training session for, for six hours, and we do like to break it up into bite-sized pieces. Now the training that we deliver, obviously there's things around health and safety, safeguarding, risk assessments, all the things you would expect for mile leader or, or more um, commonly walk leader training. However, we have recognised that our ambassadors, because they are so integral to, to the community, that actually by delivering MEC training, making every contact count, we can actually provide a very light touch social prescribing approach to our miles. Um, our ambassadors become trusted friends in their communities with that asset mapping that we do with the partners at the beginning of the project and then continue to do all the way through our, our period of time in a locality. Our ambassadors are really are able to really confidently recognise when somebody wants to make a lifestyle change and accurately sign and potentially handhold them to an appropriate service that we know often exist in, in local areas, but are often underutilised by, by the communities that, that they're designed for, whether this is through um, lack of that individual knowing about the, the service, whether it's through a feeling of stigma about accessing the service, or sometimes it's just, it's not meant for me. It's, it's not meant for me. So, so by having a member of their community handholding and saying, no, this is right for you and, and you should access this and it will support your um, goals and ambitions for healthier, happier lifestyles. We know that that works really, really well. Um, so by, by sort of months four and five, we're expecting our, our ambassadors to be um, risk assessing their own routes and starting to deliver their miles. And then from that point, we gradually stop hand-holding quite so much. We're absolutely still present. We provide them with quarterly workshops. We check in on them. And they've got WhatsApp groups within their uh, individual localities that we are in. So we monitor the, the comms that are going backwards and forwards, just making sure everyone's OK. Um, however, our, our touch, we become much more light touch from that point. Ultimately, by month 12, I want to have done ourselves out of a job. Um, I don't, we, we don't want our communities to be active, motivated, encouraged to, to be delivering these miles off their own back. Um, we're just sort of checking in with this every, every now and again. That's how we know we've, we've been successful. 
and I'm really pleased that actually in, in um, at least sort of two or three of our localities we're getting to, to that point now and we've been delivering for eight months so, so we're pretty much bang, bang on track for, for that which I'm, I'm thrilled about. Um, so let's look at our impact over the five localities that we're currently working in. Um, we currently have 47 out of a target of 50 ambassadors um, and they, these are ambassadors that are completed training and being supported to deliver regular miles in, in their localities. I have just had a quick look at our um, training matrix. We've actually trained 64 ambassadors, but we do know that from whatever reason, life, um, children going back to school, people having less time because they're back at work and they've, they've come off a of furlough that, that people have dropped out and that's fine. But to have 47 ambassadors who are actively sort of looking to, to be delivering miles in the next few, few weeks is fantastic. We have 11 regular miles being held across our localities. Some localities are a few months ahead. We, we very much staggered our start time so we didn't spread ourselves too thin. We wanted to give each area um, as much dedicated time at the beginning of our, our mobilisation as we possibly could. So the fact that, that we've, we've got 11 there, uh, we're nearly at 50% of, of our target I'm very pleased about. And we've got nearly 200 families registered to their local family mile. And that's only with 11 regular miles. <laughs> so I'm imagine what, what we'll be like when, when we've got our, our full 25 complement and, and everyone sort of miling regularly. I'm, I'm really pleased with that. We have 257 app users and between five and 10% on a weekly basis, uh, uh, on a daily basis, are using it on a daily basis. So um, yeah, so, so we get around 25 people posting each, each day, which is fantastic. And that's a very, uh, good for, for a health and wellbeing app, we are told. Um, and 84% of our milers have said that they were more active since signing up to the family mile. And that's from some previous um, data for, from our delivery in Maidstone in 2019-2020, just because uh, we haven't yet sent out that impact questionnaire for, for this miler day, for this bunch of milers. However, I'm very confident, given the conversations that we've had at our events that we've been delivering recently, that Anna mentioned that... Um, yeah, that we would have that, that sort of a similar similar level of success. And we also have 2,000 followers across all of our Facebook pages. So all good so far. Anna, back over to you. Fantastic. If you can put the next slide on for me, please, Rosie. Thank you. So the first point on that impact, I'd just like to obviously point out that obviously during the last 18 months, we've had particularly challenging times with it being COVID. So I'm personally delighted with the impact results of the five localities. And um, looking at those localities and the progress of the team and the ambassadors and the work we've been doing on the patch, I think it's fair to say that a large part of that success is down to the um, commitment of our fantastic partners on the patch. So Rosie spoke earlier about the importance of that steering group from the outset. Um, and it is really integral to that model because the partners have been that front door to the local people. They're the people, they're, the, the partners are trusted by those local communities and they are the ones that have enabled the mile to be such a success in those local areas. So I think it's just a, a really important point to make. Hence why we're really keen when we come into a new area or before we come into a new area to really understand the landscape and, and really get to know the local partners. So just to summarise then um, on some bits that Rosie's talked about today with the family mile, why, why choose the family mile? Why would you want to partner with us? Why, why the family mile in Greater Manchester? But as Rosie's um, spoken about, we, we've got that track record. We've been delivering across those five localities and we've got plans over the next four to six months to do further localities across the southeast. Uh, and obviously bigger plans to roll out, which I'm going to talk about shortly across Greater Manchester. Um, we, the, the family mile is that starting point. Um, it, it, it is the, it, we, we found it is a great way of engaging, but also we are able to then escalate um, participants to other services and support. So the idea is that's the, the first step, but there's so many more activities that we can then introduce. And the, the wider that partnership network is, the better opportunities we've got to then support um, and signpost people to, to further the help to, to support their overall well-being. 
the, the family mile we feel is a really ideal approach to support communities post COVID, but particularly we know looking at the data, those communities that have been hardest hit by the pandemic are those that are from some of those more vulnerable um, target communities. So this is a great way to, to, to reactivate or activate those communities and then help signpost them with their, their wider health needs. Um, it aligns to the Sport England strategy. I'm sure most of you are aware of United the Movement. It, it aligns to that in terms of the targeting, the um, ensuring it is an activity that is, is truly accessible to everybody. That ambassador model really gives that local ownership. And, and as Rosie has spoken about earlier, that is the key to our sustainability. The ambassadors enable us to be local with the, the, the local delivery partners, obviously. Um, and that is how we truly reflect those needs. Uh, we've, we, we love the local delivery um, partner route because certainly from my perspective, I, my background is public health and the, the biggest thing I've challenged us as an organisation on, if we're saying that our U USP is that we're local and we know we've been successful with that in the South East, how are we going to remain truly local when we move into Greater Manchester and we move into Birmingham? And the key to that it is everybody else, it's you guys, it's the partners around the patch that, that really are integral to that model. And like Rosie said earlier, that allows us to then provide further investment into those localities also, which is a, a win-win. And um, that makes the family, the, the model with the ambassadors makes the family more sustainable, scalable and viable, because as, as Rosie said, we are aiming to be able to provide that infrastructure, infrastructure toolkit, but then gradually move away from the locality. So the locality own the mile, it's their mile, it's delivered in a way that works for them. So that continues to grow organically beyond the funding period. So the mile becomes something that is ongoing. Um, the local delivery partners ensure we always remain local, as I said earlier. And we've got this track, strong track record now with the local and the national partners to, to support and endorse that model. And on that, we are uh, really excited about the um, relationship with the de um, developing with Loughborough University around the evaluation of the, the mile. And there's two parts to this that I'm really keen to further develop. Obviously, the first being the impact. Do we are we achieving at scale what we want to achieve, which is ultimately activating and supporting the health and well-being of those that need it most? And the second part is really um, challenging um, our delivery model and ensuring our delivery model is right. So when we are delivering with our ambassadors and we have various different um, local delivery partners, where does it work the best? Where doesn't it work? How do we ensure um, sustainability of our ambassadors and retention? How do we ensure that we keep the mile alive once we've moved out of the, the area? And these are the things that Loughborough will be supporting us on to ensure that our model continues to grow and develop. And obviously, from our perspective, we're keen to share that learning um, to help support future developments for, for, for physical activity and wellbeing services nationally. Thanks, Rosie. You okay to change slide? So what does this mean for you guys? Um, obviously, we are, we're an ambitious charity um, and we are looking to, to roll out across um, the Northwest. We've identified Greater Manchester for various reasons. We already have um, partners that are interested in that area. We know there's lots of areas of need within Greater Manchester. So from January 2022, we're seeking to um, gain the support from partners to allow us to roll out across the, the area. At this point in time, we have not identified those areas. We are targeting specific um, organisations because we're keen to work with, work with organisations that we've worked with before. So in the South East, we know we've got great, uh, we've got great track record with local authorities, housing associations, active partnerships and a number of corporate partners, particularly from the construction industry, actually. So that model works well. So just to provide a bit of background, obviously I spoke earlier about Sport England seed funding for the, the first two initial years of, of our growth and development. But Sport England have been very clear as we um, grow and develop, we are, as a charity, having to be sustainable in our own right. So that funding from Sport England won't continue. 
Um, and therefore, it's important for us to have a model whereby we can seek funding from other key partners. So we've identified various partners that will be involved and support the delivery because our vision and values align so nicely. And we are engaging with um, various organisers organisations, including Onwards Housing, um, about delivery potentially across the Tameside and, and Oldham area, but we, we are yet to identify um, the, the full partnership to enable that to be confirmed, but that is certainly the ambition. We're in discussions with Trafford Housing around some delivery in Trafford, and what we're looking for is at least a further four localities for delivery across 2022. Um, to, to really en enable us to, to, to um, scale across the area. And obviously, as, as time goes on, we want to further scale. So the more interest we've got from partners across Greater Manchester, the better. And when I say interest, that's interest in terms of shared values, alignment, operational or strategic. So clearly, we do need to identify resources and funding to be able to deliver. But equally important, we need to identify partners that are going to help us with that model in terms of that navigation and knitting all of those services together. Because we see ourselves as part of that glue, to, as Rosie said, to enable um, a soft touch social prescribing approach. So... That's, um, I think that's it from us. I'm very keen to hear from people around the table. If anyone's got any specific questions, um, fire away. If not, Rosie and I are very happy to take these offline and have a chat with organisations individually if people want to, to talk to us in more detail about our plans and how we can work together. Brilliant. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Rosie. Um, Jess, Tanuja, anything from you, from your organisation or from your work perspective? Or? I think it'd be good for a joke, sorry, if you can email me everything and then I can have a discussion with our team and then we can take it from there. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll plan to, um, so with this recording, plan to um, create a link to it so people can see it, share the slides that Rosie and Anna have talked to. Um, and there's also some supporting documents that um, um, I've shared with some partners. I'll make sure you get it directly you're having signed on. Um, I just want to check, uh, Tanuja, is it helpful that um, if I email your details directly to Anna and Rosie, are you okay for that as well? Yeah, want... definitely. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And Jess, the same with you. Are you happy to go directly for me to share their details with you? Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Okay, so I'll do that and I'll check with the other people who booked on and I'll call and then you can pick up the dialogue as well as, of course, you sharing with your organisation, people getting in touch. You know, um, any, any immediate thoughts and questions, though? Um, my thoughts was I liked the idea of photography and history um, because that can be very intergenerational uh, between people that aren't related, um, especially when there's, there's history and heritage in your walk. And then young people teaching other people how to take good photos on your phone. Um, I liked that. Um, and there's other little categories that you could do to really entice young people into the interests. I know a lot of the young people that we work with don't necessarily come as a family, they come as an individual. So getting them involved, I think, with a wider network and a community within itself would be really positive. Um, I know you touched on it a little bit, but how are you sort of mapping where to best place this across the boroughs? Because I know you've Oldham and Tameside are like the top of GM and then you've got, it's quite a big area. So how are you deciding? Do you want to take that? Yep, so um, it really is, it's through um, looking at our target audiences so so those um so, so we look at the demographics of, of the boroughs of the individual boroughs and we look for um, ones with high prevalence of uh quintiles people living in quintiles one and two so sort of low-income families yep. um ethnically diverse communities and also those communities with a high prevalence of need in terms of uh, disability or, or long-term health condition so they really are our focus that's our, our number one sort of how we approach it However, it's also very dependent on local partnerships that we create, both operationally and strategically. So you can have um, a, a 
locality that absolutely ticks every single box in terms of our, our diversity and uh, uh, aims and ambitions. However, if we don't have the, the strategic uh, engagement there, then it, it won't be a success. So, so it really is a fine balance of, of those, those things. Um, yeah. Oldham and Tameside, they, they were localities um, that were very much identified by Onward and the conversations we had with them because that's where they have quite a lot of housing stock. Um, so, so that's why they, they have been mapped. And after sort of reviewing, again, they do sort of, um, they do meet our, our, our needs in terms of demographics and, and our aims and ambitions to, to sort of support those communities that are considered vulnerable or less likely to engage. However, however we do know that Greater Manchester is, is huge, it's, it's a large yeah. area. So really we would like to be as, as sort of accessible as we possibly can be rather than sort of clustering it, as you said, all sort of at, at the top. But yeah, ultimately it does come down to the engagement we have with strategic and operational partners. Yeah. So are all of your partners um, big organisations like local authorities or do you have the little walking groups that you can maybe empower to change? Yeah, so, so those walking groups that, that we can empower and work with, they are the ideal candidates for our local delivery partners. So not only can, can we work with them in terms of um, providing them infrastructure and support and financial uh, uh, benefit as becoming a local delivery partner, we also sort of offer almost a coaching role. And so, so we're a charity that three years ago was very small. We were, we were working in a, in a small area of, of Maidstone, which is a town in Kent. Yeah. And now we, we have these ambition four years later to be a national sort of charity that, that encourages people to do a mile. So we want to support other organisations uh, as we've been supported by, by other organisations to sort of grow, develop and, and yeah, and deliver within a community. So absolutely, we're looking to partner yeah. with those, those smaller organisations. Yeah, and on that, you know, um, I did share this opportunity through um, 10GM, our BCSE sector, and I was obviously be ensure that um, network was, was engaged. And, and Jess, picking up on your point that you made about young people coming as individuals and things, would you, perhaps through your, your work and your network, if, if say, if Oldham and Thames are just because we're talking yeah. about you know, you'd maybe able to help bring in those types of into the discussions around the partnership. Yeah. I think that's a role we play. Is that fair, Jess? Yeah. Yeah. Young people are better at equality and diversity than any adult I've ever met. Um, so I think targeting young people that are willing to engage in youth services or with a youth worker, I think, would be key and really prevalent in moving forward, I think. And as well as for like levels of deprivation, everyone sort of knows around here that we've got more working class people than anything else. So I think you'll definitely hit the mark there because um, we've got more working class areas than any other sort of area. Um, so I think young people are, who know their own identity as working class, um, the worker bee goes a long way in Greater Manchester. A lot of young people are, are on are on their own sort of identity there. Um, so I think that's, I don't even think it would be too much of a challenge, to be honest. That's, that's actually really lovely to, to hear. And actually all of our localities, once once we work out the niche, so if in Greater Manchester, it's it's young people that have that really strong identity and that yeah. affinity with, with the local area. Once we find out the niche, we have seen it just absolutely fly and, and take off. So great it's great that that that's almost so so obvious in greater manchester I yeah. suppose. And grassroots is dead important i don't know how the rest of the country is but every leader across gm will talk about grassroots um how it's got to be bottom up not top down yeah, yeah. that's something that's absolutely core to our yeah. approach absolutely absolutely and that's one of the things that resonated when we had that first chat wasn't it anna and rosie about about the approach about how it fits with the Greater Manchester uh, ethos. I mean, yeah. The only way it's going to work, to be honest. So yeah, yeah. We're all in agreement there. Absolutely. Tanuja, any thoughts from your own organisation perspective? I know you want to share it and stuff. Any thoughts stimulated from what you've heard? I think we've just our whole been a big organisation. We cover wide areas. We've, we've up to Markham, um, Nottingham. So yeah. Um, I'll have a discussion with my team on this. Like I said, that's why I asked for the information. 
because obviously we can all get involved. Um, I, I know I've started a few walking groups around Cheetah Mill area. Um, so I can definitely speak to those residents that I'm working with at the moment and those who need a lot more support and various things. So yeah, I think definitely bottoms up. Um, I agree with that. Um, yeah, I can just, we can just Brilliant. take it from there and see how it goes. Fantastic. It might also be worth us picking up at a later date around your where you've got high concentration of housing stock within specific areas of Greater Manchester, just to give us that understanding. Because as we spoke about, obviously, Greater Manchester is a big place. Uh, where are jigsaw homes as priorities, just so that we can really understand and ensure, because for us, we want to meet the needs of our partners. So yeah. if we've got that insight from the outset, that's you, that's really helpful. Yeah. I think uh, why the stock is in Tameside, all of Tameside, is um, it used to be New Charter Homes, which is now Jigsaw Home. Um, Adaptive Housing had all the Manchester areas, um, so they're all scattered around between North Manchester, South Manchester, and East Manchester. So yeah, but Tameside, we've got the majority um, of okay. stock. Okay, it'd probably be good good for us to pick up in a bit more detail on Thames. Yeah, 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 definitely fabulous. Okay, once we're connected, we can we can continue those discussions. Yeah, fabulous. Sure. Thank you. And I know you're uh, trying to talk with the local authority there in Thames. I'm really meeting, aren't you? So that's that's great. Um, those yeah. Great. Um, are there any other thoughts or questions here, or should I just get collating? This, these resources, I'll, I'll email you directly uh, and I'll make the connections in to so pick up the conversations. But is there anything else before we leave? No, not for me. Great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Thank you for your time. Uh, and I'll pick up with the people that haven't come here uh, and Rosie and make sure that I can connect you directly. And we'll go yeah. Fabulous. All right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. See you soon. Bye. Bye.